we'll start recording. So good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to, this session probably will not take a whole hour this morning, but we want to talk, I want to talk to you guys about the last thing on my great teaching list. Um, it, first, I want to talk to you about where this teaching list came from. Um, our college, as well as lots of other colleges around the country, have recognized that there is a performance gap between different groups at our college. Um, and in general, and this is a true almost across the country, is that um, the standard for performance is often the highest performing students are often white females. And so then the question becomes, why do white females outperform other groups like white males or black females or black males um, or Hispanics or in certain parts of the country, the standard might be different because of the demographics of that area. Um, there are some places where Asians outperform other people. So the question then becomes, why do they outperform them and can we can we get everybody up to the same level? You know, should we be able to? And if we are thinking about how to do that, what are the ways in which we can do that? Um, and, and there's lots of discussion about why it is that there are performance gaps, right? Um, there are some inherent biases in our teaching that we may or may not be um, familiar with or recognize. Um, there are difference in preparations for students because of inherent um, built-in biases in the K through 12 system. Um, but then once you get beyond that and you say, okay, well, I can't do anything about how the students are that come to me, but can I do anything to help them perform better once they get to me, right? Because that's what happened in the past has happened, but now that they're in your class, how do you help them perform at a high level? And there's lots of people around the country discussing this and talking about it and trying to come up with ideas and ways to do it. And there, you know, we have lots of supports here on campus that you guys have seen, um, some of which, and you'll see some more this morning when we talk about advising. Um, but to my knowledge, there's only been one really good study done on how to close some of these performance gaps. Um, and it was done at a community college outside of Chicago. Um, and it's called, uh, oh my gosh, Oakland Community College. So like Oakland, California, but Oakland is, is in um, outside of Chicago. Um, and they, they started thinking about this several years ago and they did a study with their faculty and they implemented a four point teaching um, program to help their faculty improve teaching and to help change some of these performance um, gaps is what we call them between different groups. And they had, it's the only study that I can seem to find that I've even had our librarians look for it on how to change these performance gaps or we often call them gender gaps or um, race gaps, um, but they're performance gaps between different demographics. Um, and they, the conclusion was, they, they actually set about a study where they, they worked with some faculty and then they had another set of faculty it was a control group and they looked at the beginning and then after they implemented a teaching program with this one set of faculty. And that set of faculty did four things with their students. We talked on Wednesday last week about names. They were required to learn every student's name within the first two weeks, within the first week of class, actually. So that's that's a big ask for some of us because you might have a hundred new students to learn all those names in a week is tough. We get it, but names are important. Okay, and we already knew that. There's lots of research that dealt with names. Okay, the second thing that they asked them to do is just because a student might have come to your class unprepared, don't accept that as saying that you can accept low academic performance. Just because the student hasn't performed well in the past doesn't mean they can't perform well now. 
you have to believe that the student can perform well now. Because if you don't, then what does that say to the student? That, oh, well, you're just not, you're going to make a, a D or an F just because that's what you always do. No, that's not acceptable, right? Our job is to help them pass the class and to get ready for the next step, whether the next step is taking another course or taking their certifications or boards or whatever it is, or going out into the workforce. Our job is to get them there, and that's our high academic standards. But we also have to be prepared to get them there. We have to show them all the resources we have that can get them there. So, um, and that includes things like academic tutoring, which you guys heard about. Um, it, re it means things like um, we have a MMSI, a minority male um, scholarship program. We have scholarship programs. We have financial aid programs on campus. Um, we have lots of things through our foundation and through financial aid to help pay for some of the costs of college. Um, we have a food pantry on campus to address some of the food insecurity or, or whole person needs of a, of a student. So we have all those supports in place to help the student perform better academically because that's what we expect. Um, the third thing that we talked about last week that dealt with great teaching that they found is really important is formative assessments. And you have to do a formative assessment within the first two weeks of class and return it in a timely manner with some constructive criticism. So that's the third step, right? And we talked about all that you guys came up, you guys shared some amazing formative assessments that some of you are already planning on doing or have done in the past. Those are important. It's important to do it at the very beginning so that you show the student, hey, I'm here to work with you. I'm here. I'm going to put in the time and effort to tell you what you're doing well and what you need to improve on, and we're on this journey together. Okay? The fourth thing and the last thing that they found was extremely important for students in helping them perform well in your class is kind of a... It has nothing to do with academics, actually, at all. And it could have something to do with academics, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to. And that's that these faculty members were required to meet with every student in their class outside of class for 10 minutes. Um, and that's, I understand, for some of us, that's a huge ask. Um, I'm looking on the list of people. Um, I'm trying to like Keisha I know Keisha teaches um, she's got lecture and lab for three different chemistry sections each one of them is going to have depending upon where we decide to do with caps and stuff she's going to have a total of close to 60 students right that she is, are new so 60 students times 10 minutes that's 600 minutes, right? That's 10 hours of meeting time with those students. That's a big ask, right? And there are some people that have even more than that. There are some people that have 100 new students this semester. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of time. But what does it do when you take the time, 10 minutes, to meet with the student? What do you think what do you think we're trying to accomplish with that 10 minutes of meeting time anybody connections making a connection connections mm -hmm. and so you're trying to because what have we been talking about for four days building relationships with students right and that one-on-one -on -one time then shows hey you value that student right and it means that it's really important for you. Now, in our virtual world, because some of us are going to teach virtual, you can do them virtually, but they really are. The connections are even stronger if you do it in person. Okay? So we recommend in person if possible. Okay? Um, and I'm going to tell you what I am going to do this semester, because I've never done this either. What I am or met with my students one-on-one, -on -one, never required it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my computer off and I'm going to turn my screens off and I'm going to sit there and talk to the student for 10 minutes. Okay. It's kind of like um, my wife and I eat 
dinner together every night and we have a rule no phones no tv no nothing right i even take my apple watch off because when it starts vibrating you're, you're like you look at it, it's just right you can't help yourself so i take that off and set it to the side we put our phones face down the ringers are off so for that 30 minutes when we're sitting at the table we are 100 percent focused on each other okay so for that 10 minutes you need to focus on the student okay is that fair enough i'm not saying there's nobody's going to punish you if you don't do this i'm giving you this a suggestion for how to help build relationships with your students so there's some steps that you're going to need to know to go to do this a how do you schedule these meetings with your students that's a lot of scheduling right anybody have any suggestions for how to schedule with students I mean go ahead somebody started talking Anybody have a suggestion on how to schedule? It, it kicked me off right when I was saying something, <laughs> but um, I, um, I'm going to try to pick a recurring time that I'm available and working on the farm. Um, I've, I've got a lot of physical work out here, so I'm going to have a standing rule that I'll talk to anybody for as long as they're working next to me. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. I like that because they're doing stuff that they would have to do anyway, right? They're going to have to learn how to do that kind of stuff anyway. Yeah, so that's exactly right. You're actually, yeah. you're teaching as well as building that one-on-one -on -one time with the student. That's awesome. I like it. I put a link in the chat box to a um, site that some of us use called Calendly. It'll actually sync with your Google Calendar, right? Because we're a Google school. So Calendly will sync up with your Google Calendar. And you can go into Calendly and set up 10-minute you know, you can you can tell it you want to meet for 10 minutes with students and it'll take look at your Google calendar and figure out when you're free. And those are the only times it'll offer for students to say students can go into that to your link in Calendly and sign up for a time. Because or I mean, if you're really old school like me, you can or I probably won't do this, but you can put sign up sheets on your door, right? Hey, I'm available these hours come sign up okay Calendly is kind of like the electronic version of that um, and a lot of us use Calendly are there any other good apps or programs for scheduling meeting times like that with students anybody know of any I guess not we're very quiet um, you can use a Google spreadsheet that yeah have time set out and let them uh, put their times in like their name if there's any time that's available for them yeah you could do that yeah just use a Google sheet and share the sheet with the students with all the times that you're going to be available have them sign up for a time on there yep Calendly is cool because it sends um, it'll send them reminders and stuff too if you set it up correctly but yeah Google sheet that's a simple way to do it, right? Hey, I'm available. I'm out on the farm working from this time to this time. Come at 9, 9 to 9, 10. That's your time, right? I mean, that when they sign up. Um, I'm, I'm going to combine it this year. Like I told you guys the other day, I think about one of the early assignments I do in my classes I have them find my office take a selfie and email it to me and it accomplishes a lot of stuff for me um, and for them I'm, I'm gonna just combine that right I mean they have to sign up for a 10 minute time block when they come for that 10 minute time block they now know where my office is um, then I'm still gonna make them take a selfie and email it to me so that they they now have learned my email address right so um, where do you meet them at? Where? Well, you can meet them anywhere, right? I'm going to meet them in my office because I'm in my office most, 
most of the time. You can meet them on the farm. Are there any places that, anywhere else you can meet them? Or are there places you should not meet your students? Is that a good question? Are there places you should not meet your students? Be safe on campus, right, sir? Safer on campus, definitely. Um, always with an open door, right? I mean, if I have a student in my office, my door is always open. Um, you'll hear about Title IX at some point in the next few months. But yeah, always have an open door. Yep. Are you allowed to meet students off campus? Um, that's always a tricky question. Uh, there are some faculty members that do some work with students off campus just because once they have some sort of relationship with their students, they, they're just like, they're the, I know of one faculty member in particular, he's like, he's really comfortable meeting students in a coffee shop. And so they meet at a local coffee shop and they, they work on problems there. Right. And in public is always best, right? You don't want, I would never recommend you have a student come to your house. That would be a very bad idea. Okay. Um, any, but your office is best, but not every student can necessarily do that. Okay. So understand that they can maybe do it some way else. You could use Blackboard Collaborate. You could use Google Meet. Um, you could use Zoom. There are lots of online virtual, you know, virtual options for meeting your students, but face to face in person is best if possible. Um, so I'm looking, I gotta look at, look something up. I had something I wanted to share and now I can't find it. We have more people in here this morning now. People have shown up. People are being very quiet this morning. Sonny, do you meet with your students outside of class? You've already been here a little while, so I'm picking on you. Do you meet with your students early on outside of class? Oh, that's fine. Bring it on. Um, uh, yeah, we do because we have clinicals pretty much. If they're not on campus, they're at clinicals. So, um, I'll usually try to find time kind of in between breaks just so that they don't have to come back to campus because they're already running places. So it'll usually be the same day of class and lab, but like a time with just us. So maybe a break for everybody else and then we go in and, you know, talk and catch up and then just kind of rotate through all the students throughout the day. Yeah. And you guys have a cohorted system as well. So they're like, they know each other pretty much anyway. And so, um, it's a it's a little bit different when you have a small a relatively small group that knows each other as well so um it's all about building those relationships and you're just part of that group at that point so yeah, yeah definitely tiffany you're a veteran instructor been teaching for more than two years so you said the other day how long what do you do as far as something like this i do the same thing sunny does because you know i've taught in pta programs and pt programs that have cohorts so <clears throat> if they're out on clinicals we're required um, by our accreditation body to do site visits so mm -hmm. we schedule site visits throughout the week um, normally midterm and final week um, in the beginning we do an open house and an information session and that's where we start building our relationships, where, where we get their name. That's where the popsicle stick comes into play. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that, because it's, it's like a little family for a good year and a half, two years. Um, but they stay together and it's either, you know, get along or it's kind of like a family. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's and sisters or whatever it may be. So, and then um, every semester, every class or course that I teach, it's an open door. I will schedule 10 minutes with them. You know, how's your semester going? What are your expectations? What are your fears, concerns for the, the quarter or the semester? Um, 
and then we just roll with that. And then at the end, I wrap it all up again. So I meet with them a lot throughout the whole semester and their um, cohorts. So. Yeah. And I have an open door policy. Come, come and chat whenever you need to. So. Yeah, I think what you'll see is that um, the open door policy is very common, right, for really good instructors. Right. Because it means that, hey, my I'm here, and I you can be the focus of what I'm doing. Sometimes students are afraid to come into your office, right? They think, oh, well, you're a college instructor and you're too busy to talk to me. I'm just I'm just a student, right? Right. But I think if you set that expectation up early on and you meet with them, then they know that they can come in, they can sit down in a chair, and they can talk to you about something, right? So. Right. If I haven't spoken to a student in a while because of that, I will say, hey, can you meet me after class? Or let's come in and chat and just say, you know, check on them um, throughout the semester. Yep. yep. So I guess then the question becomes, all right, so we're going to meet with our students. What are we going to talk about in that 10 minutes? Keisha, what do you, Keisha's picture just popped up, so I'm going to pick on her. Keisha, what do you want to talk to your students about for 10 minutes? Well, I mean, initially, I was thinking even in terms of logistics and numbers, if you have a, a huge class and you're, you're, you're strapped for time, um, especially if you have labs and they work typically in pairs or twos or threes, mm -hmm. whatever, um, I'll probably take it by the group. And then from there, have an extension. You can come to my office at uh, this other time. So kind of start it as a mini group or three, four group, and then, you know, open the, the invitation to come in. Um, whenever you, um, as a group, I guess it'd be general discussions, you know, in terms of, you know, what's going on, any difficulties. And then if it gets a little bit more um, slightly personal, then it would have to be kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Then you kind of see, you know, if somebody's having trouble and then you kind of figure out if you need to direct them to help um, outside of, you know, what you can actually do, so something like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, um, I can say this, you're gonna have all the same students in lab that you have in lecture, and so, what I found teaching lab is I kind of informally do this in lab as opposed to having to do a formal, having them come to my office. Um, and that works a lot, but I'm intrigued to see how it works this semester because I'll have two sections that meet at the same time for lecture and I only have one of them for lab. And so I'm going to, I want to see how they perform versus the ones that have somebody else for lab. Not that the material they're going to get in lab is different, but just with the connections that I'll make with them in lab, because that's where I often make good connections with students. So, so what else are you guys going to talk to your students about when they come see you for 10 minutes? Anybody? It's also a good time just to get to know them, ask them about their self, themselves and, you know, just share information so you can make a rapport with the student, um, you know, and let them sort of see how they're doing in class and ask them how, how am I doing so that, you know, you can sort of make that connection with the student. So what, so you're talking about um, getting to know them and, and their needs. So what kinds of what kinds of needs do you think that they might be, I mean, it's early on, they may or may not be willing to share everything with you, right? Um, and so there's lots of, uh, we need a session on um, nonverbal communication, right? Because if you look at your student, sometimes you can tell that they're uncomfortable with being there or that there's other things going on in their life. And so it might be a chance for you to, open up that avenue to show them that we have some other supports for them, right? So maybe they're, you know, I don't know, 
Maybe you can hear their stomach growling and you know they're hungry. Okay, we have a food pantry if you don't have, if you weren't able to eat breakfast this morning because you had to put gas in your car, right? So we have those kinds of things available. So um, it, uh, we have some things like mental health counseling that we don't do on campus, but we can refer them to, right? So there are things like that that we have um, that that are good for your students that you need to uh, not do an assessment on them, but be aware of so that you can refer them to things. And this is the kind of thing that can come up. And a lot of times our students have never had anybody ask them, you know, they don't, they see it as a, a lot of students see college as a one-way street that we're giving them stuff. Um, and, and that stuff is the information. Um, they don't necessarily understand that we have lots of other things that are outside of that information that we can also give to them that will help them be successful. And so at, I find that 10 minutes, I'm going to cover a lot of ground about how can I support you as a student or as a person, as a whole person, to be more successful in my class. I don't necessarily going to focus so much on academics unless it's really necessary because I think that I'll do that more in class. But, um, I mean, it might be that they want to talk about academics and we can do that. Some students will be extremely intimidated by coming to you one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because they hold you in esteem because you're a college instructor. How do you overcome that? How do you overcome that intimidation factor when they come to your office? Anybody? Just have to try and as much as you can just to be real and give them that's all they can do because you have to as an instructor you have to overcome the stereotype or schema or whatever and there are different types um so you just have to just try and be as natural as you can and just encourage them that there's not much you can do because everybody has their their their, their their own stereotype student Yeah, be yourself. Look for, try to figure out, you know, as you're talking to them or as they come in, try to think about anything that would be common ground for you, right? So, I don't know. I teach a lot of vet med students in my Chem 130 class. So, um, we will oftentimes talk about the zoo that I have in my house, right? Like, I mean, I have three cats and three dogs. And so, you know, we can often start building a relationship based on that. Um, Gen Chem um, or some of the other, you know, I mean, some of the very specific like health science programs, I mean, okay, well, you're in sonography. What, you know, why do you want to be in sonography? And they start to tell you why. Oh, yeah, that's a great, you know, I had a case one time that was just like that, right? Here's what happened with me when this occurred, right? So any common ground that you can use to kind of build that, hey, I'm just like you. We're in this together. I'm here to help support you. Um, I'm not here to give you a grade. That's not what we're here to do. That's, that's, that's kind of what they think. And it is part of what we do, but we're here to help them meet whatever their goals are. And the grades are just part of that. And so they have to understand that. So, um, you know, I know Thea is about relationships and she said nothing yet this morning. 
and I'm picking her because her camera's on. I can see her. Yes, I knew you were going <laughs> to pick on me. That's okay. <laughs> I know it's like to lead a, a session and no one talks. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. I get it. I mean, everything. I echo what everybody else has said. Um, just you know, being personal, being real. I don't have a lot of students who are intimidated. I don't ever have that that intimidation thing. I guess. I guess people do. If they do, I'm I'm with. Uh, is it Kaisha? I hope I said your name right. Keisha. 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 Okay. That I um I agree that the realness is you know if there's any kind of tension in a room it's usually us you know unless there's a bias like you said earlier so no i mean i'm I'm with everybody else i don't usually schedule um stuff because that just seems like they're they sometimes students feel like they're getting in trouble when you plan something for 10 minutes they have this oh i'm getting in trouble she's got an agenda it's like no you're not just come and chat so i kind of like what tiffany and sunny said like capturing them after class between visits going to site visits and that more you know you know hanging out and i used to talk to students all the time i used to sit in the student center and I wouldn't sit in my office. I did some of my office hours in the student center and where the students ate. And I talked to more students in that amount of time than I ever did in my office. Just being mobile, getting out there, yeah. eating, you know, out and about. So I'd honestly say for me, uh, the scheduling doesn't work quite as well because they feel like they're in problem, they're in trouble, but they're not. It's just trying to get to know them. So sending emails and going to the student center and they see you eating and talking, you become very real. So just looking for opportunities to connect are probably the biggest thing in my role, at least, is looking for my students, finding them on campus and finding ways to connect. Yeah. So, I love the idea of going and eating in the student center. I wish our student center was capable of doing that. <laughs> um, yes, right now it's been hard to connect more with students. Well, I Google yeah, it and, everyone and, now. I'm You'll a big see, Google even when, they're all on, even when they're all on campus, our student center really doesn't function like that, right? I mean, there's a, a bunch of LEC kids in there, and that's about yes. it. Well, we had, so, where, where I came from, we had a grill, and I didn't see a lot of students there, but near the library, there was a little place to eat outside the library, and that had tons of students. And yeah. so that's where I would kind of park myself and... You know, most people would avoid me, but a lot of students would talk to me too. So at least say hello, right? That's a start, right? Yes, and they I, do. They do. I, I did if, more there. I mean, honestly, it's, I think mm -hmm. it's what Sunny and and you guys have all said is getting out there. If you want to meet students and see how they're doing, then you'll get out there and find them because they're you not going to come to us. I mean, usually they don't come to them. us. You don't have to be the same as them, but you have to show that. Hey, I have to eat lunch too, right? And it, there's something about that that they go, oh, they're eating lunch too. It's like those of us that's been doing this for a while, it's it's like the the worst thing to happen is like they see you at Walmart shopping. I know. And they go, I have to. Not long after I came to CC and I was down the road at Walmart here in Sanford, a student, I'm in the grocery section and this student goes, hey, Dr. Powell, I'm like. Hey, because I'm like, I'm just trying to get my groceries here. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, buying groceries. I'm and grading. I think it doesn't I'm occur grading. to them that you have to do all the same stuff they do, right? I mean, we're yeah. we're just normal. And uh, and it's like, she's like, oh, yeah, right? Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. It was You're a real human hilarious. being. So, yes. so it's. You know, this is kind of the tomorrow we're going to talk about great teaching one last time, but this is the fourth tenet, right, that I think is so valuable in building those relationships. And that's spending some one on one time with a student. It doesn't have to be a lot, right? Ten minutes is, I mean, ten minutes goes about before you even blink, it's gone. Um, I do have the intimidation problem because I have the big deep voice, right? I'm the big, big bad bear. Um, and I'm a, and I'm a male as well. There's, there's a lot of that that goes with it. Right. And I get it. Um, and, uh, I had a student a few years ago told me that, um, that I was really an M&M. And I was like, what are you talking about M&M? &M? She's like, well, when I first met you, I thought that you were like all hard and, 
and like really like crusty and like you were intimidating and i'm like okay well but that's not a whole image because no once you get break through that surface layer then it's all sweet and gooey and i'm just like oh man that's bad i don't want to be sweet and gooey she's like no it's really good she goes it's fine it's it's that's what you need to be she goes but it takes some people a little while to get through that coating right and so whatever that coating is that you have as an instructor just the word instructor creates a coding on you for in student for a lot of students um and we've talked a little bit about how to meet students where they are meet them one-on-one -on -one in their class or outside of class between classes on break it's some way you have to find to meet your students one-on-one -on -one. so um i think we've talked enough about meeting your students this morning one-on-one -on -one. we one of the times that you will meet students one on one is when you do advising and we have a couple of sessions this morning a lot of you guys will just be starting to do some i mean in some of the programs like like Thea is a one person show in her program so she's going to be doing a lot of advising this semester other people that like are in ut like keisha we're going to slowly start to add advisees to her she won't get a whole advising load to start with because it, it's going to take her a little while the other we just don't have a choice for you because you're the only one right so it is what it is um but um dean byington and associate dean holmes will be here this in a, at 10 o'clock to talk to you guys about advising and everything that goes with advising yes Thea, you're in the deep end but guess what we have lots of life preservers that will throw you and we'll help you um we'll put you in a boat and row you around for a little bit if we <laughs> <Thank> can <you. laughs> so um i hope that i'm one of those life preservers for all of you guys that you feel like you can call on me at any point in any time so um that's what we're here for is to help you um between myself and um lisa and Jamie and Amanda Carter over in Distance Ed with Blackboard, um, we can answer almost any teaching question that you're going to have, I think. Almost. There might be some that we can't. I, I, I don't deal in absolutes because I'm a scientist. There are no absolutes. So, um, but, uh, so I'll let you guys go for the next few minutes. Um, we'll be done a little bit, a few minutes early here. But at 10 o'clock, um, Dean Byington's going to show up. So, um, try to come in a few minutes before 10 so that we're ready to go when they get here because that'll be pretty much a full hour talking about advising. So I'll see you guys in a little bit.